Hello, thank you for joining our webinar series um, with five smart investing strategies here today. Um, five smart investing strategies attempts to simplify the investment process. And we're gonna review five different strategies that show how we can help guide you through the, the process of the financial markets. Uh, my name is Anthony Cosentino. I'm an investment advisor representative here with Wild Wealth Management. Started my career back in 2012 um, and have enjoyed working with clients ever since. Uh, when, when you look at our team here, we've grown quite a bit over the past handful of years. And so you can see here our investment professional team here in Scottsdale. And then we also have offices in Tempe, Glendale, Payson, uh, Tucson, and San Luis Obispo. Uh, from here, we'll dive right in. So essentially, when we look at investing and, and kind of what that looks like, you know, when you create a portfolio or you start from scratch, there's five different main strategies that we want to make sure to go over with you today. Uh, the first one really is don't time the market, right? It's it's very difficult to pick when to get in and when to get out. And so, you know, we feel that that's not a smart move to try and time it. Uh, the other is asset allocation, right? Making sure that you have picked a, a, an appropriate or, um, you know, a, an appropriate allocation that's going to make sure that whether no matter what's going on in the market, your portfolio is protected. Uh, your investment selection so that take it one step further past that allocation once you've decided uh, to be able to pick the right investments and what you need. Third is or fourth is dollar cost averaging and, you know, making sure that you are investing into the market in a periodic and systematic way. You know, that way that you are not in a position where, you know, you're guessing as to when to buy in or, or move out. Right? Uh, and final is to really rebalance your portfolio. You know, we want to make sure that your portfolio is staying in alignment and, you know, it might start off in the right way. and you know, as things drift, as markets drift, you know, your portfolio can drift out of alignment and, you know, would like to make sure to keep that on track for you. Um, first, when we talk about, you know, market timing, right? And what does that look like? Well, realistically, when we, when we look at the slides here, essentially most people, you know, if you talk to anyone, the goal in investing is you want to buy when the market's down and sell when the market's up, right? So, you know, buying high and selling low. Uh, but essentially, when we look at the common approach of what people actually end up doing is, you know, they tend to buy high and, and sell when it's down. Right. And, and it's a common mistake to make. You know, you look at an investment that's going up and you you, you want to join that group of, of investors that own that asset. Right. And so you, you tend to buy in when the market's already in a, you know, in an upward movement. But the mistake is, is that you can tend to buy in when the market's already at a peak or when that investment's already uh, priced in a lot of that growth. And so you buy in at the tail end. And then as it starts to drop, you look to move out and get into something that you think might be better. And in essence, what you've now done is, is you've gone in and bought high and sold low instead of the opposite. So our goal is making sure that we're, we're coaching, you know, our clients and making sure that we are, you know, keeping that disciplined approach and really buying low and, and selling high. Right? Uh, you know, when you look at it from the standpoint of market timing, not only just buying low and selling high, but also making sure that you stay in the market, right? Uh, and not not getting in and out of the markets and staying on the sidelines for certain periods of time. Because when you look at it and you look at the slide here on the screen, uh, you know, it's very easy to miss the mark, right? When you look at the, S the S&P's average annual return uh, and you look at the 20 year period from January 1st, 1995 to December 31st, 2015, if you would have stayed in that, uh, you would have earned about a 7.68% annual return. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if you were to miss the 10 best trading days on average, your annual return would have dropped to 4%. And if you just missed 20 days out of 20 years, uh, your average annual return would have dropped significantly, significantly down to 1.57%. Uh, so really, you know, we're not saying that you need to stay in the market at every, you know, every day. And, you know, your situation might dictate moving out of the market for a certain period of time for whatever reason. Uh, but at the end of the day, the goal is here is really stay the course and, you know, try not to move in and out because it's very easy if you just miss a very small amount of days over, you know, over a 20 year span, um, you know, you're going to be in a position where you could end up missing out on significant return. Uh, next, we want to talk about asset allocation, right? When we talk about asset allocation, really what that is, is making sure that your portfolio is set up in a way that you have appropriate exposure to each asset class, which really gives you a certain level of risk, right? So the goal is here is not picking different stocks or, you know, picking different investments to guess which one is going to do better than another. The goal is making sure that you're exposed across all aspects of the market 
of really looking at and saying which ones make sense to hold and which which ones do not, right? And so from that standpoint, you know, when we look at the power of asset allocation, really we did a study a while back and about 91.5% of your overall returns really are driven by your asset allocation, right? The mix that you have between different asset classes. Only about eight and a half percent is by stock picking. Now there's always gonna be people who get lucky, uh, but overall it's really gonna be based on that broad exposure and making sure that you know, you're not actively trying to overly guess which investments can outperform another. Uh, when you when you have decided kind of what that risk level is that you want to take when you're looking at the asset allocation that you have set your mind on, the next step is to look and say, well, what assets do I want to hold? Right? Do I want to hold fixed interest? Do I want to hold stocks, bonds, whatever the case may be? And so we kind of run you through this list here of what does each asset class look like. Uh, and how does that impact my portfolio? So first you look at fixed interest. Right? Fixed interest is going to be things like CDs or some fixed annuities, right? Things of that nature. You know, the pro with a fixed interest is you're going to get a guarantee, right? You're going to get a fixed amount of interest on a periodic basis. And, you know, there's very little risk involved. Uh, the downside being is that in those situations, you're going to be in a position where there might be surrender fees, um, there might be liquidation fees, right? There might be minimum amount of time that you have to lock the funds up in. So there are going to be pros and cons to that. I mean, it is going to be the safest from a, an investment standpoint, uh, you know, but it is going to have its downsides, right? Uh, then you have stocks, right? Stocks are, are on the far other end of the spectrum. That's where your day-to-day -day investments, you know, that's going to go up and down on a, you know, on a much more aggressive basis. And, you know, based on what the market does, based on what the economy does, that's going to drastically change those returns, which can, in essence, cause you to have a very high return or a very low return based on the market and how it reacts. Uh, you know, then you have bonds, right? Bonds are going to be very stable with bonds. You know, there's not going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of day to day fluctuations. Uh, but with bonds, you're also not going to get an incredibly high return. You're going to be given a, an interest payment on a monthly basis, right? That interest payment is going to give you a certain percentage. Uh, and as long as you hold that bond all the way through, you know, you're going to get that guaranteed dividend or, or bond interest payment on that monthly basis. Uh, the hard part is with a bond is that if you do need to sell it before maturity, then it's really going to come down to what that bond is worth in the market. And so if interest rates are going up, that bond may be worth less. So these bonds, although it is similar in essence to a fixed interest investment, there is an ability to get out of it at, at any given time. However, you do take on the risk of what that bond is worth, you know, out in the market. Uh, next is cash, right? Cash is cash. So, you know, cash equivalents are going to essentially maintain a dollar per share. Uh, you know, if you're using a cash equivalent mutual fund, there is not going to be FDIC insurance. So you want to keep that in mind. They're not guaranteed against risk. However, they are going to be the most, uh, you know, the most conservative of all investments from the standpoint that they're really not going to grow much. Uh, you might get a little bit of interest here or there like you would at your bank. But really, the, the goal and the idea behind that would be funds that you might need in the short period of time. Uh, and then finally, you've got your speculative, speculative investments, right? Those are going to be investments that are going to grow with the market, but they're going to be really so risky that you're gambling and in, in the hopes that they pay off. Those really shouldn't be a very large part of the portfolio uh, in most situations. But, you know, once again, everybody's situation is a little bit different. And so when you do look to create your overall asset allocation, these are the different investments that you want to be keeping in mind as you craft that portfolio. Right. Um, the next is really when you look at taking taking that previous slide and going a little bit deeper. Right. So really focusing on the investment selection process and, you know, which investments do you want to hold and, and what does that look like? Right. Uh, and a lot of time it's going to look at, you know, what what type of rate of return are you willing to or are you hoping to gain? And with that being said, what type of downside protection or downside loss are you willing to accept? And so when you look at the graph here and you look at this long term performance chart, although you see stocks they definitely perform the, be the best and they're going to give you the highest return over that long term period of time. You're going to see if you look year over year, you're going to see different dips and you're going to see, you know, different highs. Right. And so there's just a lot more volatility involved. And if you're an, a long term investor, 
that might be, and you can stomach that volatility on a daily basis, that tends to be a highest returning asset class, right? Versus if you look at cash, that's going to be your most conservative, right? It doesn't move much. You know, you look here on the slide, 10,000 essentially grew to about 14,700 over an extended period, right? So you're going to get interest, but it's going to be very slow growth um, and you're not going to see much change. Bonds are going to be somewhere in the middle. The bonds are going to be more aggressive than cash just because they do have the ability to move up and down based on interest rates, um, but they are going to have good years and they're going to have bad years. So when you look here at the next slide and you look at you know, the scoreboard, right, of which asset classes had the best performance, right? Like we spoke about on the previous slide, you're going to notice that on the far right, the stock column essentially has had the best returns all the way down, right, given a couple of years. But with that being said, if you were in a situation like 2008, right, and you needed to be invested in a portfolio, if you were just in bonds or just in stocks, you would have taken a massive hit in your portfolio and if you had a period of time where you needed some of that money, you can't afford to draw those funds out when they're down. So that's where you see in 2008, cash was the best performing asset class, right? Uh, you fast forward, you look at 2011, it was bonds, right? And then most other years it was stocks, but really what it comes down to is making sure based on your need, you know, and how much you might need from the portfolio or how, much, how little you might need from the portfolio, what does that look like in, in how much risk you can afford to take? Um, and so that's really where constructing an appropriate portfolio based on an appropriate mix of these two different or all three of these different asset classes is really going to be, you know, your, your best option. Right? Uh, next, we talk about dollar cost averaging. Right? Dollar cost averaging is a very popular way to put funds into the portfolio over an extended period of time. Um, I know we all wish that we could put, you know, all the money in when the market was at the bottom, right? And sell it all when the market was at the top. But truth be told, like we talked about earlier, that's very hard to do. Uh, and so from that standpoint, what we recommend a lot of times is dollar cost averaging. And with dollar cost averaging, if you're able to put a specified amount of money into the portfolio on a very predetermined basis, it takes out a lot of the worry from the standpoint of what the market's doing. It helps you stay disciplined in the way that you do invest. Um, and also, a lot of times it does provide you with a more appropriate price per share. So in this situation here, when you look at dollar cost averaging in a falling market, right, you look at it and you say, well, I've invested $500 over a you know multiple period or multiple month period of time. And if prices are decreasing over time, you're buying more shares every time that you purchase as the market drops. So instead of if you would have just bought the same amount of shares each time, right, you would have ended up with you know $27.50 as a cost per share versus if you stay disciplined, you say, I'm going to buy X amount of those shares every single time. Well, as that share price drops, you're able to buy more shares. And now your cost per share is closer to $29.38 you know, a share. So it does help from the standpoint of, you know, now the, the amount of money that you have had to put in to get that equivalent amount of shares is less. And so as the market recovers and as the market rebounds, you're going to have more shares, you know, under your belt because you were able to consistently buy as those stock prices went down. Right? Um, ironically, as well, in, in a rising average or a, a rising market, uh, dollar cost averaging also can tend to work, right? It's just the, on the flip side. You end up getting more shares up front and less shares as time progresses as we move up you know the market and as the market as the share price grows each month but essentially if you're averaging those out and you were to just buy once again a certain amount of shares at a certain share price well you you would have technically spent a little bit more money versus if you just stayed consistent bought additional shares when the market was down early on and bought less shares as the market went up from the standpoint that your overall cost per share is really going to end up being equivalent. So really the moral of the story here is dollar cost averaging is not just from the standpoint of trying to get the lowest cost per share, right? Or buying at the cheapest point possible, right? Really the goal here with dollar cost averaging is maintaining discipline. You know, if you get in a situation where you say, Hey, I'm, I can afford to put X amount of dollars into the market at a certain period of time, you're going to be able to stay consistent with that 
and continue to put that same amount into the market every month, every week, whatever the case may be. And since you're putting smaller amounts in at each time, if we do see a big market drop, right, you're not going to be as concerned or if the market is at an all time high, you're not going to be as concerned devoting those funds because at the end of the day, you're only putting a small portion. You're not putting your whole nest egg into the market at that time. So it helps spread out risk, but at the same time, it also helps mentally from the standpoint of keeping the portfolio invested. Um, when we look at taking all of this a step forward, right? When you look at asset allocation, right? When you look at um, the allocation that you choose, but then also the investments that you choose, really this is where you would want to sit down as a client and talk about, you know, with a significant other, with yourself or your advisor, and really decide what is the level of risk that I'm willing to take on, right? Because in this situation, you can look at two different portfolios. The first one here being a conservative portfolio, right? This being 20% stocks, 20% bonds, and 60% cash. So realistically, you've only got 20% of the portfolio that's at risk on a daily basis, right? Um, with that portfolio over an extended period of time, you would have had, you know, $100,000 potentially as the initial investment, right? And over a 20 year period of time, you might have ended up, you know, with realistically about a 4.3% rate of return. Uh, you'd be up to about 232,000 in the best year and you would have had about a 10.46% return in that best year, but you would have only lost about 8.3% 8, 8 in a bad year, right? And I know 8.3% to lose is still no fun, but in a worst case scenario, it's gonna be much less risk than you would potentially have if you put everything in the market, right? So. If you are a conservative investor, there are ways to build a portfolio where you still have the ability to have that portfolio grow for you, uh, but you're going to take on a lot less risk in the interim. Um, then you go ahead and look at the flip side, right? Look at an aggressive portfolio. And so in this situation, you're looking at 80% of the portfolio in stocks, 10% of the portfolio in cash, and 10% of that portfolio in bonds. And so when you look at that portfolio and you look at, you know, the same concept, you invested $100,000 up front, right? Over a 20 year period, you would have seen more of an average annual return of 6.7%. So that initial, instead of 260,000, now you're looking at 367,000. However, the difference is, is that the best year you would have seen about a 25.3% return, but you have to be willing to stomach the downside in a bad year of the worst market in that period of time down 30.4%. So the moral of the story when it comes to allocation and balancing your portfolio appropriately is just, can you stomach the lows and can you afford to stomach the lows, right? Because if you can, then the more aggressive you can go, you're going to have a better return over time. Now, once again, that all comes down to your financial situation, right? Whether you're, you know, young and saving for a long time or whether you're in retirement and spending from the portfolio, right? All these different situations is really going to drive what type of risk you can take and, you know, what type of allocation you would want to be looking at, right? Now, when you look at the portfolio that you want, right, and the balance that you've achieved, at the end of the day, then you have to look at it and say, well, I've put it in this allocation today, but what does that allocation look like as we have good years and as we have bad years, right? Uh, if you look at this slide here, if, if we're talking about 1997 on the left and 2017 on the right, you know, if you have an investor that started out saying, I want to be right in the middle, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, that's going to be a situation where you're going to say, okay, that's a very moderate risk tolerance. I'm happy with that. And let's stay there. Right. But then you fast forward and as markets move, as things shift, well, now you're 56% stocks and only 44% bonds. So in that situation, if you are in retirement and now 20 years have progressed through retirement, well, you might not, you might even want to be more conservative than 50, 50, but if you did nothing, now you're in a situation where your portfolio is more naturally aggressive than what you originally set up, right? So it's not just setting up your allocation up front. Really, it's going in and looking at it and saying, well, based on my allocation that I've set up up front, you know, how does that look over time and how is that allocation drifted? 
right? And making sure that we want to look at that and say, well, if your allocation has drifted, how can we make adjustments to get you back into the mix that we want you to be? Right? So we always recommend for every client to periodically take a look at your mix, right? And take a look and see where you're at. And what this helps to do is you can take, you know, the slide that we have here and, you know, sit down one night and, and pull together all your accounts, pull together your bank accounts, your investment accounts, um, and look at it and say, well, where am I really at? You know, and how much cash do I have? How much do I have in bonds? Uh, how much do I have in the fixed interest? Uh, how much do I have in stocks and speculative, right? And what you can do is you can sit down and say, you know, if you look through this slideshow and you really look at it and, and take this to heart and say, well, you know, looking at those slides a couple slides ago, I can only afford to be in that conservative allocation. And then you sit down and do this exercise and find out that you have 80% stocks. Well, that's a great thing to reach out to your financial professional and have that conversation. You know, is it's risk tolerance and risk assessment is something that changes all the time. It changes every six months. It changes every year, right? It could change more than that. So, you know, really looking at this and sitting down as an exercise and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I might have been happy in this allocation a year ago, five years ago, but now that I've come to retirement or now that I have kids or whatever the case may be, we want to make sure that you're reassessing this risk over time. And so that way, if you do want to go ahead and make changes, you know, we can go ahead and help you do so, right? Lastly, you know, in summation here, really, these are just a couple suggestions, a couple questions. Essentially, when you look at it from the standpoint of everything that we've talked through, right, everybody's allocation is going to be different. Right? Like I said, somebody who is just beginning their investment life versus somebody who is in retirement and drawing from their investments, they're going to have different goals. So, you know, taking a few scenarios here, you know, say, you're Anthony and Selena and have a growing family member and wonder, you know, what's the fastest way to amass money to buy a vacation home, right? Or you have, you know, Dave and Christine, they're in retirement and they say, you know, how do we, how do we shift our portfolio so that we can generate income to pay for our retirement and to make it last through retirement, right? Or if you have Rebecca who has a small business and she wants to know how, how should my business affect my investment decisions, right? You know, that's going to be very different from the standpoint of, you know, if you have, the business being your ideal retirement plan, you know, how do we supplement your investments with that, right? You know, or you have somebody like Isaac who does research online and he says, hey, you know, the market's been volatile. I'm, should I should I make a change to my asset allocation? You know, somebody who does some research on their own and and wants to have a conversation, right? So, you know, every every allocation, every investment performer, every every investment conversation is going to be very unique and different based on where you are in your financial situation, right? And in your financial life. And so that's where these answers are really gonna depend and that's really where we're here to help. So, you know, thank you for tuning in and on this webinar and, and these five investing strategies. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, if, if you're a current investor with us, please feel free to reach out to your investment professional. Um, if you're a new, a new potential client, feel free to reach out and any of us are happy to assist. Uh, otherwise, have a great rest of your day and you know, we look forward to hearing from you.